and uh, good evening uh, to all of you. Uh, welcome to the first uh, uh, meeting of the um, Sustainable AI IoT series. I'm Daniela Tulone, uh, founder of uh, EcoSurge. EcoSurge is a new uh, initiative uh, that is focused on the design of uh, IoT AI-based uh, solutions uh, geared towards uh, the Sustainable Development Goal. And it fosters uh, active uh, collaboration across uh, academia, business, particularly uh, SMEs uh, and uh, uh, institutions. Um, so the, the driver of this uh, series uh, is the high potential that uh, IoT and uh, AI can have uh, in accelerating the sustainability uh, targets in uh, almost every sector. And uh, in fact, uh, they represent a critical pillar, for instance, in the EU Green Deal and in other roadmaps. But uh, um uh, actually, um, I, I myself uh, no, experience uh, the, uh, the um, uh, benefit uh, on the environmental uh, um, side uh, and also on the community uh, when uh, designing uh, solutions for the uh, energy and the water sector. But uh, we know that uh, uh, these benefits uh, are not or automatic uh, and uh, it depends uh, really on the way in which we design it. So the underlying uh, algorithms uh, models, uh, um, architecture, and uh, data choice. So in one word, uh, how we embody uh, in, uh, in the um, uh, technical solution, uh, environmental needs and the social needs. And uh, uh, surely this is uh, completely new to us because we have been used to, to focus on, uh, on the technical aspect. And uh, it regards uh, the entire uh, digital uh, community and not just uh, the, the sub-community of those uh, working in uh, sustainability. But uh, it brings in uh, uh, really lots of uh, um, uh, opportunities, uh, interesting open uh, research problems, uh, and uh, for business, uh, opportunity to innovate, uh, to develop uh, new uh, products and uh, um, services that can lead uh, to business growth and to a better market positioning. So, and in this series, actually we are going to explore all these, uh, um, these uh, opportunities. Uh, so the name of uh, uh, the series is uh, Think and Do, because uh, its aim is uh, to um, gain a better understanding of what does it mean uh, to design uh, IoT AI-based uh, solutions uh, that are uh, actually can be sustainable from the environmental viewpoint, from the social and uh, economic uh, perspective. And that uh, this is not uh, uh, yet clear. But then uh, uh, um, to uh, translate, I mean, this concept into reality, and this is the most uh, uh, difficult and the, the most uh, crucial part. Um, so, in um, in terms of uh, the think part, uh, every every month uh, um, we'll uh, we'll meet on every uh, third Thursday of each month, and we'll uh, dive deep into a specific aspect of a sustainability, you know, the sustainability universe. For instance, uh, next month uh, we'll uh, focus on uh, ethical aspects uh, and then in general the positive, uh, the competitive uh, business advantage and so on, uh, circularity. So, and uh, um, and uh, actually, uh, this is uh, um, the the goal. Uh, no, is uh, to um, um, to facilitate. Uh, no, the uh, the two part. Uh, we will have uh, um, uh, a share uh, LinkedIn group uh, um, where we can uh, we can uh, post uh, some interesting material or uh, ask a question or uh, share insight. And uh, for those of you that. Are, uh, that are interested, we'll, uh, uh, we can have a follow-up uh, Zoom call in, in two weeks. So today, uh, we are going to uh, address a very uh, important problem, uh, CO2 um, reduction, uh, emission reduction. And uh, um, this is uh, the primary driver of the uh, global temperatures. You know? And uh, we know that uh, IoT and AI can reduce uh, CO2 
CO2 emission, according to some uh, study, by 20%. Uh, but we need to take into account also the CO2 emission that are produced by, by systems. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, that uh, uh, the, um, Professor Gordon Blair is uh, with us uh, today. Uh, so um, he's a distinguished professor at uh, Lancaster University and is the co-director of, uh, of the Center of uh, um, Excellence in Environmental Data Science. And he has done extensive uh, work, uh, very interesting. So thank you very much, Gordon, to be with us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so uh, some experts actually are not much uh, concerned about uh, the emission produced by a digital solution because uh, they believe uh, that uh, uh, energy efficiency in ICT will continue and that uh, renewable uh, uh, sources uh, will uh, decarbonize uh, ICT. Why do you think uh, uh, it's important uh, to um, actually look at the uh, sources of uh, greenhouse uh, emission produced by digital solution and also um, from uh, from your uh, deep uh, analysis of the current study uh, what did you conclude yeah well you you point to a study we recently carried out and I'm pleased to say that uh, Kelly and Brian who helped with that study are both on the call we carried out a study right at the start of lockdown actually when the world was going into lockdown and the this was our, our first attempt to collaborate across Zoom, and it was a fantastic project to do, to take our minds off what was happening in, in the world. We carried out this study of what is the carbon emissions of technology, particularly with innovations like AI and IoT, but not restricted to that. It's looking across the board, also considering blockchain data centres and so on. And we, we started off with the kind of questions you started off with, you know, are efficiency gains the answer? Is the move to renewables the answer? Is it that going to see a decline in carbon emissions? And we, we started off with an open book and an open mind and started looking around at what's out there. And we read all the major studies and carried out a kind of literature review. And the answers we were getting were quite disturbing, to be honest. We saw many competing narratives, but the bottom line, if you want a headline, is that efficiency gains will not reduce the carbon emissions of digital technology, quite the reverse. There's a well-known phenomena called rebound effect. And actually, if you look at carbon emissions across any sector, not just ICT, you may get some efficiencies with science or innovation, but the carbon emissions keep doing that because we do more. We want to do more. And you can see that in AI. We want to apply to bigger data sets. We want to use deep learning, more power hungry methods. And we're just doing more and more. So although there may be efficiency gains, it's not enough. The curve is doing this and carbon emissions are increasing. There's also some strong narratives that you alluded to around enablement. That is, if we have smart cities, surely that will allow for energy efficiency. It will lead to energy reduction. You know, we can switch off lights in the cities when there's nobody about and so on. Surely that will lead to reduction. But again, the evidence is that there'll be rebounds and enablement alone will not change this ever increasing slope and maybe exponential curve upwards of carbon emissions. So we found a picture that is quite disturbing and that the ICT industry has to take this more seriously. Yeah. And uh, regarding these uh, rebound effects, uh, which mm. action do you think uh, uh, could mitigate these, uh, these effects? 
that's jumping right to the heart of the argument. That's a very difficult question and one that maybe requires experts from many different disciplines to answer it. I think it certainly involves policy interventions. It involves an industry interventions. It involves design interventions to make sure when we design technology solutions, we take into account carbon emissions in the same way we take into account reliability concerns, for example. And to me and to many of us that worked in that paper, we came to the conclusion that the core to this is to constrain carbon. Now, I'm not an economist. There may be economists in the call. There's various mechanisms you can use to do that, whether it's carrot or stick, but there has to be a constraint on carbon, something related to pricing of carbon. At that point, it becomes in our interest to find more carbon efficient solutions. And if there was a carbon cap or a carbon tax, for example, then the potential of ICT gets flipped. It could become a savior because the innovation could be making things possible in a world where there are big constraints. Yeah, and also uh, not all uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, solution, the digital uh, digital system have the same, uh, I mean, uh, relevance in terms of uh, uh, so the sustainability targets, you know? So yeah. I think that uh, that should be taken into account as well. And uh, like an uh, application that actually reduce uh, uh, CO2 emission uh, should be incentivized or that, uh, I mean, uh, mitigate, um, uh, climate changes uh, effects uh, or uh, other, uh, I mean, uh, mm. uh, are focused on uh, some uh, SDG, while others, I think that, uh, yeah, uh, should uh, actually um, less in incentivize or turn, uh, transform into something that can be more efficient and uh, can, uh, can actually be more aligned with the sustainability targets. Yeah. And, uh, Actually, uh, this is a, that reminds uh, something that uh, a comment that I often uh, hear from the digital community. Sometimes, uh, even uh, in uh, in this period, uh, when I talk uh, to my former colleagues, uh, friends in uh, research and in business uh, about uh, these topics, uh, I receive uh, uh, an answer like, "Oh, this is uh, surely very interesting," but I'm not working on uh, on this uh, this aspect. So. So uh, these aspects are taken at the same, uh, um, with the same weight as other research uh, uh, topics, and probably we don't have a. Uh, uh, the deep perception of the emergency that we are experiencing, not the climate emergency. What do uh, you think? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, I think. That raises a very important point. I mean, this series is fantastic because it's raising awareness, particularly in ICT practitioners, that this is an important issue. I, I cited the example of reliability earlier. There is nobody in industry that would claim to be building something that's not reliable. Of course, you have to take reliability into account. You have to take usability into account. If we get our education right in our universities, then computing professionals would be looking at sustainability in exactly the same way they're thinking about usability and reliability, perhaps even more so because of how critical it is. And you know that events like this are fantastic just to spread the word and awareness. There's a kind of sense that there's something immaterial about technology, but it is very material. It does produce carbon and it produces very significant carbon. And when you look at the potential of growth in the ICT sector, where it's very common for things just to do this and just take off, then it's particularly important to reason very deeply. What are the carbon emissions of my innovation? Is there a way in which I can constrain that as an intrinsic part of the design? 
Yes, also because uh, including this uh, consideration, this aspect uh, actually can uh, can lead uh, to uh, really uh, to lots of uh, opportunities, as I mentioned before. So it's not uh, something that can uh, um, slow down uh, research or business growth, but on the contrary, can uh, really push, uh, give a, I mean, uh, be like a. Um, um, propulsory no force uh, for uh, for this uh, mm. and uh, i i i wanted to ask you about uh, this uh, sector no the ai technologies and mm. iot while uh, i hear some debate about uh, some uh, uh, intensive uh, uh, computational intensive techniques uh, uh, in ai like uh, deep learning uh, and uh, there is uh, uh, some discussion about a uh, blockchain um i don't don't hear much uh, debate uh, around uh, IoT, but yeah. uh, actually the number of uh, devices is increasing very rapidly, and we are going to to reach uh, 75 uh, billion of uh, connected devices by 2025, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, which is a lot. So and also because uh, I mean all these uh, technologies are actually very very much interlinked. Uh, when uh, I mean uh, we. Uh, we talk in uh, in the vast majority of uh, application. We talk about uh, sensing data, no. Yeah. So um, going into a more practical uh, um, aspect aside, no. Um, what are uh, your recommendation on which criteria? Could, uh, could drive us uh, when uh, designing new solution at, at a research level, but also uh, at the business level, not to design uh, new, new systems, uh, new products. Uh, so what, uh, what uh, could, uh, um, I mean, be the guideline to to design a, a solution that uh, uh, can actually reduce uh, CO2 emissions? Yeah, just taking a step back, because you made, I think, a very important point about how IoT sneaks under the radar compared to AI. I mean, one thing we realised very early on is that you have to look end-to-end, -end, cradle to grave at technologies and carbon emissions that are associated with that whole cycle from the embodied carbon that comes from making the device to the operational carbon that comes with running and then the end of life. And I think whereas data centers and AI focus are heavily biased towards the operational phase and the energy use at that stage, what you have with IoT is a very large increase in, in devices, as you said, which uh, the embodied carbon is very significant. And then there's the end of life and the whole issues around e-waste and any emissions associated with that. That's sometimes forgotten and you focus on the big number crunches, but the problem's wider than that. So I, I just wanted to say that. But turning to your actual question, which, which was about what do we do now? I mean, one thing we are doing now is a follow-up from the study. We've created a, a new project uh, collaborative with you know people across the UK uh, universities of Oxford Sussex and King's College London what we're looking at is the software engineering process the innovation process and we're looking at ways of designing technology where the software engineering process captures consideration of carbon emissions now that project is just starting you know, we're just a few months in, so we don't have all the answers. But one of the things we know is really important is capturing the different narratives and being transparent. It's not all about the numbers. It's all about the narratives and the tensions and exposing them. So the, the, the narratives about will my technology assist in reduction of carbon? If so, how? Or will it Will there be rebounds? And what are these rebounds? And working through that is an intrinsic and explicit part of the design process. And we're looking at uh, 
ways of pulling all this qualitative and quantitative data together in a design lab where you design an innovation and as part of that you work through all these narratives and it's not a not it's not a, a you know kind of turn, handle turning exercise it's a creative exercise to then say okay what is our desired innovation that's compatible with our climate targets, or you could generalize that. What is the innovation that's compatible with a given set of sustainable development goals? So that that's one side, you're know, making it an intrinsic part of the software engineering process. I think the other side is perhaps at the policy level and influencing policy, you know, through our professional bodies, through our governments, through the ITUT, who, by the way, are doing fantastic work in this area. Yeah, it's it's having an influence through all of these. There's no one answer. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, it's very important uh, to keep uh, the big picture. You no, know? and uh, it's mm. not a matter of uh, number, as you said. Mm. But really, to to look at uh, uh, the direction of where we want to go, and uh, and then uh, uh, build uh, on uh, on that, mm. uh, yeah. which is yeah. uh, actually a new approach for us because we tend to to focus on uh, uh, on the on the technical uh, aspects. Uh, no, so mm. it's a, it's a something new uh, for. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in, uh, uh, yeah. I'm just going. I'm going to quote one of our collaborators, Mike Berners Lee, because the thing we keep getting asked about is what is the carbon emissions of an email, and his answer to that is: if you're asking that question, you're asking the wrong question. It's not about the carbon emissions of an email. One, because you can't answer it because there's all this infrastructure supporting hundreds of thousands and millions of emails. And secondly, it's all about the composite contributions of an innovation. It's not that that fine granularity is meaningless. What matters is my new innovation, my new streaming service. What's its impact and can we reduce it to make it more compatible with the great goals that Paris gave us, which sadly, have not been taken much forward in the recent COP in my home city. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in line with the other economic sector, actually the ICT is supposed to cut their emission uh, by uh, 42% uh, mm. in uh, 2030 and 91% by mm. 2050. Uh, which is a lot, and yeah. uh, we uh, we often don't have a, a, a clear perception of, of that. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, um, yeah. and just coming just coming back in that because the, the 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 best estimates we found, the most optimistic studies in the literature, say that carbon emissions are flattening out for the ICT sector. You know that's flattening out; it's not increasing. We actually think that's not happening, and that that's overly optimistic. Flattening out is not reducing, and it's not reducing anything like that ninety-one percent number that you just quoted. So the, there's work to be done. Absolutely, and uh, um, in, uh, in your opinion, what are the the most uh, relevant uh, relevant actions uh, at the policy level and at the business level that uh, should uh, be pushed forward you now to uh, to stay aligned with these targets? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, we're entering a learning exercise because we're computer scientists. And uh, since we published this paper, we've had enormous interest in, in the UK and also uh, uh, across Europe as well from policymakers. You know, we've uh, had conference calls with Ofcom, who regulate the communications industry in the UK, and also with a government department only th this week. They're thirsty for knowledge. What is really difficult, actually, and there might be people in the call that can help with this, is how to know how to make the machineries of government work with you. Government is a, a curious beast, which us, an academic, us as academics are not used to influencing. And I think the same can be said for industry. You know, we're 
now challenging ourselves to improve our skill sets, to know how to communicate, to get real change in this sector. And that, that's quite demanding. And it, again, it's great as a forum like this, where there's academics and practitioners and no doubt policymakers involved. Yeah. It would be nice uh, to to hear. I mean, in the in the audience, uh, we have uh, people that work uh, in uh, institution, but also in uh, in the government, uh, like. Uh, um, I think uh, with the World Economic Forum, uh, the European Commission, it would be nice uh, not to, to hear from them uh, what they, mm. they think about. Uh, and uh, um, yes, and uh, Paolo Gemma, I don't know if uh, he's, uh, he joined. Uh, Paolo? I am, I am here. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Welcome, Paolo. I'm I'm glad that you you made it. <laughs> so, uh, Paolo is uh, is the chairman of the ITU uh, focus group on uh, environmental uh, uh, efficiency of AI and emerging technologies, and also is a senior specialist of uh, energy and infrastructure at Huawei. Paolo, um, what do you think about this, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, which uh, um, um, which action at the policy level, but also at business level, can uh, 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 should uh, push forward? Not easy to answer, Daniel. <coughs> Sorry. Well, what is uh, it's not very easy. Okay, if we if I look, okay. Uh, I think that we need to look on uh, not only on uh, energy consumption and on, on operation for for equipment, but all the global impact is something that also Gordon said a little that we need to look also in waste and so on. As a policy level, they need to make, uh, I suppose, as I do, to make a clear policy. Uh, pushing to move to a more uh, environmental friendly uh, solution. Uh, but this may be from, could be as uh, uh, to have a, a respect of some uh, trajectory for the CO2 reduction, that was something that was established by ITU in collaboration with other companies like JZ, uh, uh, SBTI and GSMA to make uh, an idea on which should be the uh, reduction that uh, the ICT sector need to do to respect the Paris Agreement. This can be implemented by regulatory in, uh, in some ways. Uh, in, uh, if I look on Europe, there is a very big discussion how to improve the, uh, the regulation in which role to use and in, in which way. Some ones is, could be, there is a big uh, discussion if it will be some voluntary or obligatory requirements. So it's, uh, it's something that we can see, we will see uh, what will be happen really. Sure, any type of regulation need to be based on something that will be uh, in some way scientifically accepted. So, or in some standardization, because when we speak as a reduction, we need a way to measure the reduction differently. Is, uh, we are just speaking <laughs> about no nothing. And this is a, a big question. As ITU, we are writing uh, standard on how to make an assessment of LCA or service or product. Uh, also, okay, establish the trajectory looking also in some way on the, try to look on some way in the future, we are working to how to measure the benefit to ICT in other sectors. That is very, very, very complicated. It's not so easy to do. Right? Mm. Because there is a lot of estimation on this, uh, but I don't know which should be the good estimation, which should be not the good estimation. Because if I look in the paper, I can find a completely different number from one paper to the other. So it's, uh, mm. And this, we need to find an agreement how to measure. Regarding the focus group, we are looking on which is the input of, a, of artificial intelligence, which could be the benefit input, because it's uh, an idea, okay, I can use artificial intelligence to reduce the carbon emission something, 
to increase maybe have a better efficiency, I don't know, in cooling or so on. But uh, artificial intelligence consumes something. At the end, we need a server and a data center. And uh, this is the big question, okay, I want to see, uh, like we speak about the rebound effect, the sun is okay. I, I introduced a very fantastic routine that uh, reduces my CO2 emission on one ton, but then consume maybe 10 ton to be implemented. And this is, uh, this is just the scope of our focus group that we are not looking on also in, on artificial intelligence, but we are looking also on blockchain and so on. We said, okay, we, we see, we want to try to estimate, to calculate, which should be the benefit, but look also on which is the consequences of this. Because we think that any time that we implement a new technology, a new product, a new network, it's better to look before on which should be the consequence and not after. Because after, uh, at that point, if you have a solution implemented, you cannot change. It's, uh, something that is very, will be very difficult to change. Yeah, and also what I notice is that there is a, a general perception that having uh, lots of data uh, can uh, can bring uh, automatically a uh, higher value. No, um, I mean, uh, no, a kind of a, a equation: uh, more data, more value, or uh, uh, AI techniques uh, means uh, something innovative. And uh, this is like a something that I observe in the business uh, community, no? Uh, while actually, I mean, uh, uh, data can uh, can provide, of course, uh, uh, added value, but it really depends uh, uh, on, uh, I mean, uh, it should be driven by the target and what we, uh, we want to get. And not uh, like, uh, okay, let's uh, collect data because uh, later on uh, we'll, uh, we'll use it. We think that uh, when we collect data, we have uh, to be clearly defined before which is the scope. Differently, we just uh, collect data, spending time and energy. This is clear. Is, uh, the idea is to, we need to be, have clear which is the goal uh, that we want because uh, collecting data, just to collecting data should be nice for a marketing issue, but not for the environment. So, this technique that they're using big data, you can reduce the uh, energy uh, efficiency, maybe like uh, um, increase the efficiency of agriculture because you're collecting all the data of meteorological case, you can have a better uh, management of the uh, cultivation, the water that you use, and so on. But it is okay because we have a clear scope. If just you collect data for nothing, uh, it's, uh, it's not, it's not what we want. <laughs> the benefit will be not, not clear on this. Yeah, if, if I can just come back in, because Paolo made a very good point about the different numbers out there. And I think this is really important. There are different numbers out there. And when we dipped into the literature, it was a bit bamboozling at first. So our methodology was then to go back to the authors of different studies and dig deep into how they produced the numbers what assumptions they made, and so on. And then suddenly things became clearer. There's very good reasons why the numbers are different. And it often comes down to what people were counting as in scope of ICT, you know, digital TVs in scope, is blockchain in scope, and also the, the, the level to which they studied the full life cycle analysis and where they truncated that, which is a difficult thing to do. So there's very good reasons and you can unpack it and from that you can start to get a feel for what the actual numbers are. But I, I think that the, the, there's a problem in this sector that there's a tendency for us to divide and fragment and some people believe Belkay's figures and some people believe Malmedin's figures and they'll, they'll fall out about it. But actually what we need is collaboration. We need to get together. The numbers don't matter. What is needed is collaboration and concerted effort in this, this area. Let's agree the numbers are kind of in this ballpark. They're not looking good. Let's do something about it. I think that's really important. 
Absolutely, that's a, that's a crucial uh, collaboration and to define uh, like a, some uh, clear methodology, you know, to, uh, uh, yeah. to do these. Uh, and transparency, transparency around the numbers and the methodology. Yes. And um, Horacio, um, I want to ask you, uh, in, from your uh, viewpoint, uh, what can accelerate uh, this, uh, this process uh, uh, to this uh, decarbonization process? Horacio, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I okay. was just copying a, a URL that I'm pa uh, pasting here into the chat because I believe we all became very aware of the real a problem a couple of years ago when our colleagues at UMass, Straubel and colleagues, uh, published that uh, famous report that they equated the training of an ML model mm -hmm. with the, uh, it was five times worse than the, uh, than a car over their entire span of life. So everyone in the community started to panic. Everyone started to say, Guess what? This is about time that we look not only at AI to save the world at any cost, but also at the uh, carbon footprint and the consumption. And, and we uh, here, uh, we have seen different trends, specifically in our, uh, here in, in Ireland and in Dublin, there have been an interesting trend from providers. So. As we all know, uh, data centers represent a substantial issue in this problem. And what we saw is Amazon, I don't know, subsequently announced a very interesting program here in Ireland. They basically team up with uh, the council, the South Dublin uh, County Council, in order to recycle the heat from his data centers. So rather than throw it into the atmosphere, they started to use to pump it and to use it to heat houses. And it, it, if you look at that way, it's, it's, hmm. it was a clever move in two parts. First and foremost, from the public perception. Okay, so they are no longer the bad guys, but they are helping a, communities to get hit for free pretty much and working with the council but also in a very important way they have a an important role in uh, looking at uh, their own data center and we as a community i can tell you that about the same time uh, we put together uh, a cost action the cost action it's called cerceras for those of you based in Europe, a co no, or not based in Europe, I would say, a ser a cost actions are networks of academics, a industry practitioners, and government officers a in order to pursue a very a specific objective. And we at Cerceras, I just pasted the URL, okay. What we're looking at is at the ba basic the impact of parallel computing devices and multi-core, specifically in uh, resources with an emphasis on energy. Because we all know, I mean, by now everyone, every one of us uh, with von Neumann and standard computers know that we have a multi-core device. I mean, we have even a mobile phone with multi-cores, we need to know what is the impact, how to uh, administer better resources and to work on that. So what we are doing in Cerceras is trying to come up with a clever techniques into better ways to use and administer energy. So uh, I can tell you that uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Gordon and the rest of the panelists in the sense that energy and energy constraints and environmental constraints should become part of the standard training for anyone in this discipline. So it has to be like testing, like software engineering. It, that has to be part of what we do. 
And that is an important part. And I actually was quite uh, interested in a question that was posed by Carolina mm -hmm. Sanchez, because it's a very interesting question. It was at uh, 5, 12 in the afternoon, at least Dublin time. So that should be 6, 12 in Central European, where she was saying is if quantum computing is just going to add even more to the ICT carbon emissions. And the answer is yes and no. And why? Uh, on the positive uh, side, I would say on the no, it's if uh, quantum computing finally delivers on a quantum leap, excuse the pun, uh, in performance and ways to solving problems faster, therefore, it will consume less energy. Simple. On the, ye uh, on the yes side, of course, uh, at the at the common te at the way technology is at the moment, they require very low temperatures, and in order to reach such low temperatures for a substantial number of qubits and operate, they require high amounts of energy, and <laughs> back to back to square one. So. Uh, so that the possible gain in terms of performance and, and energy consumption may be uh, written off by the current uh, constraints in terms of uh, getting cool off the, the system. So let's see, I, many of us in the HPC community, in the supercomputing side are betting on, on quantum. But to be honest, the current technologies for Neumann architectures and will be for the foreseeable future. So we have to learn to cope better with resources, to administer better, and to keep energy as one of the key criteria when designing programs, software solutions, and of course, hardware. Okay. So that would be my two cents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would like uh, actually to uh, to hear from uh, Ricardo Trubriani. Uh, he is the uh, strategy lead at Microsoft Italy, and uh, recently Microsoft uh, announced uh, the intention uh, to become uh, carbon negative by 2030. And uh, I I would like uh, to to hear uh, which action uh, are put in place at uh, Microsoft uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions uh, in uh, like a cloud uh, uh, infrastructure and also in other. Thanks, Daniela. I heard also a lot of interesting thing uh, from uh, the other panelists. So thank you so much for, uh, for this. Um, well, yes, Microsoft as other companies uh, has made uh, uh, its commitments, uh, very serious commitments on, uh, on sustainability. And uh, those commitments are reflected in the way we operate uh, internally and externally um, on the ecosystem. So for example, internally, uh, we um, uh, modified uh, seriously the way we conduct uh, the operations inside the company. So we have a strategy um, uh, divided in four pillars. Uh, one is carbon, the other is waste, uh, the other is uh, uh, water and uh, ecosystem. So we try to act uh, on those four pillars uh, uh, in uh, all the aspects uh, in the way we, we run the business. So from the way we operate our data centers uh, to the way we, um, uh, we, we do our products. So, uh, of course, Microsoft uh, as uh, uh, AWS uh, uh, build and operate uh, data centers for uh, its cloud computing services. And uh, what we are trying to do is to use uh, um, different technologies, so combining different technologies to be more efficient in the way we operate uh, those data centers. So for example, um, it, it was mentioned a lot of uh, um, technologies and uh, for most are also buzzwords, no? like uh, AOT, AI, uh, 
uh, blockchain, quantum, but what does it mean really? So uh, IoT is the technology that helps you to have a better measurement no? on uh, uh, infrastructure, for example. And uh, uh, AI can be a tool to uh, make you uh, make you do better decisions, no? So for example, you can also use AI to create prescriptive actions coming from your data in order to, to be more rapid in, in take decisions can, that can save uh, a lot of uh, waste, for example. And uh, what we are doing in, uh, in our data center, uh, we are creating dashboards, combining all of those uh, technologies to uh, optimize the energy factors, uh, optimize the uh, the way we, um, 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 you know, the way we have uh, uh, the, the components, and to uh, get those components with a longer life. So, for example, with predictive maintenance, we reduce the um, amounts of components that we need to change every year. Uh, but those are just examples, no? And uh, um, the other big part that Microsoft uh, is uh, um, uh, doing uh, on the market is trying to uh, offer uh, new tools um, to our customers and partners in order to be more efficient in uh, uh, the way to reach the sustainability goals. For example, recently we announced uh, uh, one tool that is called the uh, Emission Impact Dashboard. This tool, for example, um, it's uh, very useful to track the amount of CO2 emission tied to the cloud workload that is used by the customer. So uh, there is a dynamic dashboard that can help you to measure uh, how much emissions are tied to the workload of, uh, of the cloud. And uh, uh, it also gives you a comparison to an infrastructure on-premise. So if you um, have the same amount of tools uh, uh, of an ICT infrastructure used <clears throat> in an in a in-house data center, how much it is the CO2 savings uh, uh, from using cloud data services, for example. Uh, and this is very useful for uh, um, uh, optimizing the uh, infrastructure decisions of uh, uh, an ICT uh, of a company. But of course, uh, um, infrastructure is just a, a part of the problem. What we are doing, for example, in a, on a cooperation scale is that uh, we are participating on the Green Software Foundation uh, with Accenture, uh, GitHub, uh, and the Linux Foundation. And uh, uh, this Green Software Foundation aims to give uh, best practices uh, to developers to create and write uh, uh, more <coughs> energy efficient code on an application. <clears throat> so two parts of the problem, no? infrastructure and code. How you write the code of an application can seriously impact the amount of uh, resources uh, your, your solution um, uh, uh, uses. So this is very, very important. And uh, for what regards the management, uh, because also the management of a company uh, can have a, a big impact on uh, uh, how to reach the sustainability goals. And we announced the, a cloud for sustainability, which is basically a project management tool for reaching your sustainability goals. So you can connect uh, data sources, internal, external, and uh, um, calculate your KPIs uh, for a business unit and assign tasks dedicated to, to those goals. And this is very important because um, it, it was touched before also by other panelists. Uh, one of, of the biggest challenges is how to measure <coughs> the uh, CO2 emission and how to, uh, to manage, no? Because uh, of course, what you can measure cannot be managed. And uh, blockchain AI, IoT can be technologies that help you do this. And uh, this uh, cloud for sustainability is uh, something that can help companies to do it in a more simple way. Uh, one of the mm, coolest things of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, platform is that uh, it's open. So it can be connected also by other third-party solutions. 
And uh, there is also a common data model uh, which is empowered by another initiative uh, of Microsoft called the uh, uh, Global uh, Planetary Computer, uh, where basically universities, uh, researcher centers, uh, startups that work in this field um, um, share and collaborate on a common data model for sustainability goals. So um, as you can see, there are a lot of, uh, of efforts to put in place and uh, uh, a lot of uh, technologies that can be combined to, to bring values to the market. And we are trying to do our part uh, to, to help the ecosystem to, to, to reach the common goal. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. Um, actually, uh, all of you uh, have mentioned about uh, initiative or uh, things that are going on or guidelines. Can you please uh, post these, uh, the, the links to, for instance, uh, guidelines or to uh, these uh, projects uh, in the uh, LinkedIn group? Uh, all of you, that will be very helpful so that uh, we uh, people can, uh, can actually have a look at this. So I don't know if uh, uh, you want to, to add something, Gordon, or we can look maybe at the questions, uh, Shivam. Yeah, I just had one comment. I think it's been great hearing about all these efficiencies and this innovation. And having been in the ICT sector for years, I'm very proud about how innovative we can be. The one thing I keep, I keep coming back to, you've probably seen in houses a plaque saying, beware of the dog. <laughs> you've probably seen that. As a dog lover, I actually think that they're misrepresented. I think the plaque that we should have is beware of the rebound. Because the goal is not about innovation or efficiency, the goal is carbon reduction. And it's very easy to innovate and make things more efficient, but actually not to reduce the carbon. And that comes down to what where we came in, really thinking very seriously about rebounds. And that, 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 I think that's a, a core message. If I had to leave one message for the audience tonight, that's what it would be. Okay, thank you very much, Gordon. Shiva, uh, is there any question left? Yeah, hi Daniel. I guess uh, I'll should take already took two questions. So I guess uh, I we can just take beyond that, or should we repeat these two questions for the other panelists? How, how other panelists? Think? So maybe I can repeat the question, and then if if the panelists have some answer, we could just take it. Otherwise, we'll move to the next one. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So the, the first question came is, is quantum computing going to add even more strain to ICT carbon emissions? I think that Horacio uh, yeah. already took this question. Yeah. Yeah. I think I addressed that one that it's, it's not a simple answer because there might be, it's a yes or no. I guess one question falling to that one and the whole discussion would be, so what is one hanging fruit, the low, lowest hanging fruit, which we could start with that could address the concerns which we're all discussing? Certainly, I mean, there are multiple aspects which you have to look at, but there could be one hang, low hanging fruit which we could start with. Maybe panelists could help answer that. I would say that uh, I think there is uh, there are three things that have to be addressed here. And it's going to be education, education, and education. <laughs> Unless we we get we really get aware on the uh, on the carbon emissions, and we take into account when we decide and this decide what models to use, what uh, architectures we will part, and uh, we can look at other engineering uh, fields. Uh, for years, we've been including microprocessors and uh, devices into lifts, into elevators, right? And since we all, the, the designers know that it's gonna last for 20 plus years, there is low emissions, low energy, they, can, they are very efficient. I mean, and you hardly see issues in, in lifts because we all know that 
the cause and the strain and the possible legal repercussions. So leaf designers, they are not, in most cases, they are not highly sophisticated uh, technology breakthroughs, but they work efficiently, low emissions, low energy, very robust software and the rest of it. That's the way we should go. That's my two cents here. <laughs> Thanks, Gordon. Hmm. So the next question is from Gabby. It's like, uh, I wonder if the issues are an ICT issue or whether there's any responsibility beyond the ICT sector. And if so, what could that even be? Yeah, if I can come in with this, clearly this is not an ICT problem. Clearly it's a global problem that affects every sector. It comes down to jewels and sec. Gordon, we cannot hear you. organizations. We all have the ability to do something. I think my internet was unstable there. I don't yes. know if you could hear me. Yes, now uh, it's fine. Yeah, I was just I was just saying we happen to be ICT professionals. So what we can do is influence the ICT sector. But of course, it's a global issue. 